let's explore the foundation and early history of Princeton Quadrangle Club. We'll have to go back all the way to 1901, when a group of students from the class of 1902 decide to create another eating club at Princeton University. They secure funding from Taylor Pine, a wealthy resident of Princeton. They create a corporation. They purchase a house, which used to belong to uh, Professor Fine. And they draft a constitution, calling themselves the Princeton Quadrangle Club. From this constitution, we can actually um, get an idea of how the early quad would have functioned. We know that um, one of the restrictions for membership was you had to not be a member of a secret society. And the selection process um, would have been uh, very different from the sign-in process. First, it would have been held in March as opposed to uh, January, February, as it is now. And it would have started with a nomination of a sophomore by junior members. And two votes could have excluded a sophomore from becoming nominated. Then the nominees would have to be confirmed by two-thirds of the senior class. And then, finally, a member would have to be elected to the club by a two-thirds vote of both juniors and seniors. So it, it would have been a very uh, selective process. Now, dues. Um, so this is interesting. The current uh, club charges sort of a flat rate um, for a year. Whereas in the beginning, there was a kind of a, a partially membership, partially pay-as-you-go type structure. So there would be an entrance fee of either $50 for juniors or $25 for seniors, which is about $1,500 uh, today. A weekly fee of about $8 and yearly dues of $10. So the total cost for a junior to join would have been about $9,000 in uh, today's money. What's interesting is that the, today, the dues are about you know, nine and a half thousand dollars which means that it's actually more expensive um, to uh, pay for the club today than it would have been a hundred years ago. Including the fact that today we have much larger sections. In fact, the Constitution uh, stipulates that the class sections should be between 12 and 18 members. So even with that selective process, they still wanted to keep each class um, relatively small. I mean, today, a typical class would be maybe 50 to 70 members. And so yet, even with such a small class sizes, um, today, even with a larger um, section, with larger membership, um, the members actually still have higher dues, um, which suggests that there must have been either lower labor costs or some lower fixed costs or perhaps lower taxes, but uh, it, it was just cheaper to run an eating club 100 years ago um, than it seems to be today. Additionally, uh, the Constitution says that there shall be no gambling in the clubhouse, as well as no intoxicating liquor can be used or sold in the clubhouse. It's very um, different uh, than um, today. And so, you know, here is the list of members from the 1902 section. So this is the first class that would have joined. And here they are, along with the class of 1903. And you can see them sitting in front of the fine house. Um, this is how the fine house would have looked like when uh, Quadrangle would have purchased it. Um, it was originally located next to uh, Colonial, Colonial Club, 
But uh, around 1903, Colonial Club wanted to expand. And so we find out that actually uh, they, the, the, the members of Quadrangle Club made a pretty good deal with Colonial, that Colonial Club was going to basically purchase them a, a plot of land about three times larger than the ones um, that the fine house was on. They were going to um, pay them to move the club, and they were also going to give them some additional cash, such that actually the, the club uh, boosted itself financially. So the, the house was moved to a cross prospect to in between Cannon and uh, Campus Club. And I believe if you go to the corner of Prospect Street today and you look in this direction, I believe you can still see this, this tree in the middle here is actually still there. And of course, after 100 years, it's, it's very, very big, but I believe it's still the same original tree. So after this move, the um, Quadrangle Club ended up between Cannon and Campus Club. They've, as you can see, they've actually expanded um, the fine house, um, especially adding this large addition in the back. A couple years after uh, Quadrangle left um, the fine house, the actual house itself was moved to Nassau Street, where it's there, where it's at today. And you can see that the actual structure of the house is roughly the same as it was when Quadrangle occupied it. And of course, this brings us to an interesting question that's not really explained in the Constitution or some of these early documents, and that is, why the name Quadrangle Club? A very popular theory is that it had to do with the architecture of the clubhouse, that the clubhouse was a quadrangle, or they wanted to build a clubhouse that was a quadrangle, um, but that's not true. The fine house was not a quadrangle, and as you'll see, none of the other clubhouses or plans for clubhouses would have included the structure of a quadrangle. Another potential theory is that it had to do something, it was a reference to Wilson's quadrangle plan, right? Um, President Wilson's plan to abolish the eating clubs, build the residential colleges, um, but that cannot be because Wilson was not president of the university until 1902, right? and Quadrangle was already created in 1901. Okay, so that leaves two other potential theories that, you know, have a validity because if you think about the way the other clubs are named, such as Ivy or Cannon, um, they, they tend to make references to Princeton University. Now, you could say there are two potential quadrangles in Princeton at that time. Right? Rocky would not be built until later, so you know the Rocky Quadrangle would, would not be one of them. But we do have Cannon Green, which is sort of the original uh, campus, or the, the back of the original campus is kind of the quadrangle with NASA Hall on one end, Wigan Clio on the other, and you have the two dormitories. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is a kind of a reference to uh, Mr. Pine, who was included as a um, associate member of the club for helping getting the club started. And, you know, Mr. Pine donated uh, the East Pine Library, and that is a quadrangle at the time probably would have been the only if not the most famous quadrangle on campus so it's it's a very po possible that the club was named in reference to either east pine library or maybe to the quadrangle of the actual campus itself but of course um, all of these are just possibilities since really none of the documents um, really explain why Quadrangle Club is called Quadrangle. But in terms of the club colors being blue and gold, there, there, there is a, um, 
I, I think there's a much more clear connection, a much more clear explanation. So in 1910, we know that the Board of Trustees adopted the House of NASA Shield as the club insignia. Okay, and the House of NASA, and that's this is the same house that NASA Hole, NASA Street is named after. The shield is blue and gold. And in, I think in some way this su further supports the theory that you know the name of the club is a reference to some quadrangle of Princeton campus, you know, either East Pine or Cannon Green, since you know all of these names, all of these symbols somehow tie back to the university. Okay, so by 1910, we have a somewhat established club that's running, have a clubhouse, and, you know, through this nice deal with Colonial Club, it's, you know, quite well um, established. But, of course, now they would like to get a better clubhouse, a nicer clubhouse. Um, they would basically like to expand. And in this time period, there seemed to be kind of two, two sides to, 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 to this clubhouse um, situation. On one side, their graduate board would like to build a new house. And they hire an architect to design it. And the design looks like this. And this clubhouse is as big and as grand as it looks in this picture. It's about, it's three stories tall. It has very large billiards room for about you know, four billiard tables. It has a terrace. It has a common room that's about 23 by about 75 feet. Now that, that, is, that is a very, very large common room. This whole clubhouse would have been absolutely enormous, even compared to the clubhouses that were on Prospect. But it seems at the same time, um, the undergraduates were interested in purchasing the Nikosh house, which would have been just a little bit down Prospect Street. And so they, they form a committee to um, look into purchasing this uh, clubhouse. This is a picture of the Nikosh house, um, and it actually comes with a lot of a very large backyard that stretches all the way down to, to that picket fence. Here is a more modern picture of the house. Yes, the house is still around today. It also made its way to NASA Street. So by 1910, um, they basically form an undergraduate committee to explore the purchase of the Nikosh property. This was March 19th. In April, considering the feedback of the undergraduates, the graduate board actually still proceeds to try to fundraise the money to build the, this beautiful designed um, clubhouse. Unfortunately, as things go, they wanted to build that clubhouse in the summer of 1910. They were unable to raise the funds. So by October, they basically decided that um, between the sale of our current clubhouse, we can, you know, basically afford to purchase the Nikosh property, um, which they did. And by February, um, they sold the old clubhouse to Tower Club, and they moved from uh, the, the fine house to the uh, Nikosh house. And here is a picture of the backyard of the Mikosh house. This is a couple of years later. But of course, you know, things 
things change and, you know, a class is graduate. So the, for two years um, or so, they were happy to be in the Nakash house. But by, by 1912, basically, wanted, they again wanted to expand. They wanted to have a nicer, more modern clubhouse. And basically, what they decided to do was send out a um, basically a survey to figure out what should be done about the clubhouse. There were effectively two options. One was to build a new clubhouse. And the second option was, of course, to renovate, alter the current clubhouse. And we do have a copy uh, of this survey. And um, it, it is a very interesting document because it really looks, it, it has, um, it captures some problems of the time that are still very relevant today. You know, that some comments made in that report, as we'll see, show that, you know, in some way, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this um, survey. So first, the survey outlines the general situation. So they're saying, well, all the clubhouses on, you know, all the other clubs have these very nice, handsome houses, um, with the exception of Charter, but Charter was already building a, a beautiful clubhouse. And of course, these clubhouses are beautiful on the outside. They are comfortable on the inside. Our house, well, it may be comfortable on the inside, as comfortable as the old clubhouse, but its appeal to the eye is a matter of taste in regards to which there is a wide divergence of opinion, quote unquote. Um, and uh, arguably, it's a similar case with our current clubhouse. You know, some, some people also uh, have divergent opinions um, about its looks. And of course, they admit that um, the undergraduates uh, are influenced by the actual clubhouse when they, when they pick a club. And in some way, I think that is still somewhat true today. Of course, most of the clubhouses, you know, the, the standard is, I guess, is more uniform than what they may be describing here in 1912. But nonetheless, the, the amenities, the food are part of the choice you know, that, that undergraduates consider when they choose one club versus another. And then the, this, this, this survey, this report, basically describes two plans. The first plan is a plan for a new house, where basically the, they want to fundraise $42,000 to build the 1910 design of the clubhouse, um, also fundraise some extra money for grounds and uh, furnishings, and of course, the club um, is already eleven thousand um, dollars has eleven thousand dollars of liabilities. Um, but nonetheless, we can fundraise this all combined. You know, would be about sixty three thousand um, sixty three thousand dollars. They will sell bonds to fundraise this from the alumni body, and they do mention that the greatest safeguard that they have for securing this investment is the back property. This back property is never used now and probably never will be used. It is a large enough to sell or rent without all at all affecting the comfort of the club, which in many ways is true. The, the backyard, you know, receives minimal usage, although it's true that a part of it for a long time was a parking lot. But of course, in you know, 1912, automobiles and parking lots would not really have been in consideration. They also mentioned that there will be a boulevard, uh, which is being constructed apparently at the time, which would run from the graduate school to Broadmead. Um, this would mean this would be a street that would basically go through the middle of campus. So it um, would have been interesting uh, 
that, that they would be building this kind of street. Although at that time, I suppose, there really would not be much there in lower campus, um, which would increase the value of that back property. Again, that can be either sold or rented. So if the club ever gets into financial straits, the back property can be rented or sold uh, to save the club from any financial embarrassment. Um, and the part of the backyard was actually sold in 1997, around that time, um, to help cover some of the costs of um, constructing the uh, solarium, basically the club expansion. Not that it was saving it from financial straits or financial embarrassment, but you know, it, 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 it always was an asset for the club. So that's, the, that, that's basically the new house plan. And as soon as, you know, 1913, there was an opportunity or a potential to sell the backyard and the Mikosh house to Arch Club. So basically, you take the house, roll it down the hill, and, you know, basically say, okay, you know, Arch Club, you can buy it, you can have it um, in some way behind Cannon, that used to be Arbor Club behind terrace, uh, behind, um, behind tower, you know, there was prospect club. So, you know, it would have been a similar arrangement, but uh, this actually never happened. The second plan was, of course, to basically make alterations to the present clubhouse. And they had two reasons for this. So one is a reference in some way back to Wilson's quadrangle plan such to address the criticisms of snobbery and extravagance that these clubs are elitist, that they're very exclusive, and that they're, you know, basically having these beautiful exteriors, but actually they're running hopelessly into debt just to keep up this appearance of wealth, which is not really there. To address that, you know, Quadrangle Club can lead by example. We can keep a nice, simple clubhouse that's just comfortable for the members on the inside and we're not going to build another palace like all the other clubhouses. So, so that's one, so this is kind of a, a moral argument. The second argument was in some way much more practical. Can they actually afford a new clubhouse? Right? They tried to fundraise money for the new clubhouse back in 1910. That didn't work. They tried to fundraise money to help with purchasing the Mikash property. That didn't really work. And they tried to fundraise money to help pay off the mortgage on the Mikash property. And that didn't really work. And in some ways, it's not a surprise. By 1912, the club has 10 classes of, of alumni, 10 graduating classes. You know, if each section even had the maximum of 18 members, you're talking about 180 people. So you would be splitting these, you know, huge costs by a very small number of people. There is not an alumni base to really support these kinds of projects. So, you know, what, what chance would you actually have of fundraising the money this time? Right? I mean, after all, it's only two years later. Well, by October 4th, they got their responses, so they got 77 replies. Um, now, it's kind of, a, kind of interesting that they got 77 re replies. You could imagine if this survey also went to undergraduates, that most of the undergraduates responded, and there would have been maybe around 30 of them. So about half of the responses are from the undergraduates, and the other 40 or so are probably from the 180 alumni, so you know, not not a not a bad response rate, but but well maybe maybe for 1912 with you know telegraph and telephone and these kind of technologies just just getting started maybe maybe it's not a bad response rate at all. But either way, out of the 77, uh, 63 wanted a new clubhouse. So the majority of people said, yeah, well you know moral argument, yeah we we we, we want to build a nice new clubhouse sort of matches the, the the grandeur of these other clubhouses okay fair enough 
at this point, um, you see, a lot of these, these, these records come from a single notebook that was kept by the graduate board where they would record all the meeting notes. Unfortunately, by 1912, 1913, uh, these meeting notes begin to disappear. What seemed to have happened was, first, the undergraduate secretary got a typewriter so that the undergraduate meeting notes were kept typewritten. And then we know the graduate secretary got approval from the board to get a typewriter. And at that point, we only have, a, I believe, one typewritten set of notes from 1913 or 1914, and then the record disappears. And the notes are no longer kept inside this notebook. Perhaps the individual typewritten sheets were actually lost. Either way, the record, it, it, it's not clearly explained how we go from the decision to build a new clubhouse to the actual plan of the house. We do know that they did not go with the 1910 design. Most likely because they realized, well, you know, we, we were not going to fundraise that much money. So instead, they hired an alumni from the class of 1905, Mr. Milliken, to draw and design the clubhouse we see today. And here's another, another picture of it. And, that, and we can actually go through the design of this clubhouse because it was described in an alumni directory on the 15th, uh, the 15th anniversary alumni directory. And now we can go through what the design of the house was and how it has changed. So first we can see that the building is 84 by 42 feet. Now remember, the dining room in the 1910 plan was something like 25 by 70. All right, so the dining room or the common room in the original design was almost as big as this entire clubhouse. So this is definitely a, a downside. So if you want to imagine how big that clubhouse was, the, 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 the common room is as big as our entire clubhouse is today. And we know it's, it's actually built almost exactly on the uh, location of the Nakash house with the old stadium. This would be the old stadium, but then nonetheless, the stadium in the back. And, you know, as, as we see it today, salmon pink brick with stones. Um, the trim is white. In the center, now the doorway in the center actually apparently is somehow inspired or copied from an example um, that was in the Metropolitan Museum. Interestingly enough, um, you have boxed hedges um, and the loan, and I, I like this reference that the, the, the front loan will be left unbroken by any carriageway. So not a driveway, but a carriageway. And the roof is, of course, laid with weathered shingle tile. And I believe that today, if you look at the roof, you see the same tile as is referenced here about 100 years ago. Now, the entrance. So now we're going to go through the entrance. Now, the entrance, circular, just as see today. On one side, we have the cloakroom. On the other side, we still we have the stairway. And of course, directly opposite, is the living room with five great windows opening onto a balcony, which of course overlooks the garden and the courts. Um, and the walls, as well as other principal rooms, are furnished with simple panels and painted in soft colors. We don't know what those soft colors were, but um, those rooms were painted. And there's the billiard room to the west, as it is today, and the library to the east, as it is today. Although the billiards room is not painted, which means at some point um, maybe the paneling was actually changed in that room. 
Now, going upstairs, this is where things get really interesting. So above this floor are the sleeping accommodations for graduates. There are six large sunny bedrooms and a dormitory for 35 or 40 men with showers and washrooms conveniently. At the head of the stairs is a large ladies room for use on game days and for dances. The servants quarters are entirely cut off from this portion with a separate stairway. Okay, you can take this from the back. So the servants quarters are today the officer bedrooms. And indeed there was no uh, doorway there, it was completely separate at some point and there was a staircase um, inside basically a, a closet that would go all the way down to the kitchen. Um, the last part of the staircase was actually removed a few years ago uh, to build a bigger storage space but yes, so the servants quarter are the officer um, officer bedrooms. The ladies room is today the TV room and as you're walking up the stairs and you look closely at the moldings, you can actually see where a doorway used to be. So the actual doorway to the TV room, to the ladies' room, would open up directly onto the staircase. And then we get to this, uh, this part which I could never figure out. I, I, I just don't see where upstairs you can fit six large sunny bedrooms and a dormitory for 40 people I, 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 I don't know I, I thought about it I looked at upstairs you know six bedrooms okay but uh, but the dormitory I, I really have no idea where that would have been but at least there were seems like they were trying to at least provide a little bit of space for every member I mean it's uh, I don't know. If someone can figure that out, they can, they can let me know. Now, going downstairs, we have the living room. But, um, below the living room, of course, we have the dining room, just as today, with large windows and a terrace. Uh, we have the kitchens to the east, just as today. And to the west, there will be two large private dining rooms. Now, that's today the bar room where we have the bar that's that's where these two large dining rooms would have been and if you think about it actually the bar area is not that big so if you divide it by two and still call that a large then perhaps those six large bedrooms upstairs were actually not that big maybe you know maybe 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 our sense of the word large is is, is different than what they were um, what they had in mind and in the stair hole is the door to the locker room, which also has an exterior entrance. Um, so this, this, this locker room must have been where the bathrooms are. And if you're going down the stairs before you enter the dining room, and you look back, you can see a boarded up kind of doorway, which probably is what they're referring to as the doorway which led to the locker room. And probably the locker room would have had a door where the kegerator roughly is. So you can actually go outside. Really neat. And of course, then we get to the actual backyard. And you know, basically there's just a description that there's a garden, then you have some courts, some tennis courts, then you have a meadow, then you have some other courts, and then you have Ivy Lane. So at that time, it was mostly just used as a place for tennis courts. Um, it's, it's 150 feet wide, 600 feet deep, and a 40 foot drop. So they they make a you know they make some thoughts about maybe working out some landscaping scheme, which you know I think is an idea. And the backyard is huge and it's beautiful. Um, except, of course, anyone who spent a year there knows that when the students are at Princeton during the fall, during the winter, and during the spring. It tends to be cold, it tends to be dark, it tends to rain, and it tends to snow. So there really isn't that much appeal for most of the year for having really a backyard or a lot of backyard outdoor amenities. But nonetheless, it, 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 it really is, and it, it was even bigger space than it is today. And of course, lastly, we you know, 
we 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 will end on you know the old Nakash house was sold, moved away, and the new foundations of the house were being built, and they were hoping to finish everything by commencement and basically have the new clubhouse in operation by 1916. And the Nakash house is still out there on Nassau Street. It's actually a little bit further down from the fine house. Um, both of them um, still there, still being private residences today. And here's a picture of what the new clubhouse that was erected on the side of the Nakash house looked like. For the most part, it looks almost exactly the way it looks today, with possibly the only difference being that there seems to be some kind of a glass structure, some kind of a little veranda in the in front of the doorway that is that is no longer there. So I hope everyone uh, enjoyed this presentation. I would like to thank Bob Hilliard, um, the Princeton University Mud Library, as well as the Architectural Archives at University of Pennsylvania for the scans of the documents and photos that helped create this presentation. Thank you for listening.